Okay, Jess, over to you. So, hello everybody. I'm Jess. Um, as Linda said, I'm one of the diagnosticians with Axia. Um, and today I'm going to be having a chat to you about eating. Autism, what's food got to do with it? There you go. I very quickly changed the presentation slides and the title of it. So, first off, a bit about me. Um, I'm also a mentor and a trainer as well as a diagnostician. Um, I was diagnosed as dyslexic in 2003 when I was uh, 16, uh, just started college. Uh, and I was diagnosed as autistic at the age of 31 or um, in 2018. Um, I've got a bit of an obsession with food. I love it. It's a bit of a special interest for me. Um, I've just finished writing a chapter um, for a book by Sarah Hendricks, who few of you will know it is my mother yes we look alike and yes we sound alike as well so let's just get that out the way and just leave that there please um so I've just written a chapter in her new book on autism and eating um what absolutely baffled me was that there really isn't a huge amount out there um about it apart from some really horrible literature which I will get onto in a bit so I did my PGC, um, a postgraduate certificate in autism with a focus on eating disorders. Um, this was a couple of years ago. And again, there wasn't much out there. There is a lot more now um, on, on the subject of autism, autism and eating disorders and the kind of links between the two of them. Um, my relationship with food has been checkered, to say the least. Um, as a small child, all I would eat was tinned hot dogs and spaghetti hoops, um, sometimes sweet corn, sometimes peas. It would change daily um, and my mother never knew what to feed me. She would also force feed me at times, which we now know is a big no, no. We do not do that to, to other human beings. But, you know, this was the 80s, early 90s. Nobody knew anything about kids back then. Um, I now eat a very broad kind of selection of food but I'm still very picky um, with certain things like tomatoes um, this is an image taken from Charlie and Lola uh, the, the tv and book series um, for children and I will not ever never eat a tomato it's just not going to happen I'll eat tomato sauce absolutely fine but it's the fresh tomatoes that are a massive problem for me and for me that's texture as well as taste and the, as well as smell um, and I'll be talking a little bit about the kind of sensory differences with eating um, and how that, how being autistic can impact on that. So, what's autism got to do with eating? Everything, absolutely everything. And if we think about the kind of diagnostic criteria of social aspects of eating, the sensory aspects of eating, uh, routines, flexibility, interests as well. All of this has a massive impact on how people eat and their enjoyment that they get from food or preparing it or, or therefore lack of as well. And the other thing is, is that eating is something that we have to do multiple times a day, that we cannot get away with it. As human beings, we need this. I have met people, multiple autistic people, that have said that they would absolutely love to just be able to take a pill three times a day that gives them everything that they need to be able to survive. Because that takes away all of the prep, all of the thinking, the decision making, everything that you have to do multiple times a day in order to feed yourself. It's also lifelong. It's not just in children. And this is something that we, we kind of assume. And, you know, I know in the past people kind of forgot that autistic children turned into autistic adults. Um, but we now know that, this is, you know that this happens, that we all grow up. We don't just kind of disappear or not become autistic anymore. Um, but we still have to feed ourselves. There doesn't seem to be much focus on this particular difficulty or difference within the autistic population um, like I said unless it's about horrible things to do with books there is a book out there called eating for autism the 10-step nutrition plan to help treat 
your child's autism, Asperger's or ADHD. According to them, they can cure autism, ADHD and Asperger's in 10 steps. That's phenomenal. It's also bollocks. But we'll leave that one there because I did promise I wasn't going to swear too much. So sensory eating, it's more than just likes and dislikes. And around these things, textures, tastes, smells, sounds, sights. Sometimes it's an utter repulsion that it's just the thought of something is just absolutely vile and it's just not going near that person at all. Texture appears to be more important than taste does in a kind of sensory sense. Um, and an example of this is mushrooms. I've met quite a lot of people that cannot stand the texture of mushrooms, but really like the taste of them. So we'll eat them in like a pate, for example, but would not eat them in a bolognese. So would not have lumps of it, which sort of points towards the fact that texture is, 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 a, big, is a big deal with this. The other thing with textures is that we can seek out textures as well. And crunchy things seem to be very common. So liking to snack on stuff like crisps. Um, carrot sticks are not crunchy. They do not provide the same amount of sensorial input and delight as a packet of crisps does. The other thing is that textures of things like carrots vary. Textures of things like crisps don't. And this is the same with most fruit and vegetables. So if you're somebody that doesn't like fruit and veg and you've never really considered why, maybe this is it. I'm not saying it is. I'm not absolutely not going, this is why you don't like an apple. But apples are always different, whereas a chicken nugget isn't or a packet of crisps isn't. It's safe. It's easy. It's the same. Interception. So interception is this not recognising when you are hungry or thirsty. And this, as we know, has a big impact on autistic people and therefore has an impact on when they're eating. If we are hyper focused on our absolute joyous you know, interest, everything goes out of the window with remembering to eat, remembering when we need to drink as well. And some things that I do to kind of combat that is always make sure that I've got a bottle of water by the side of me or setting alarms as well um, to make sure that I remind myself that I eat. Um, as otherwise, I just end up hangry and nobody in my household or around me wants to be around that because it's just a bit grim. So. How can we also put in new things, introduce new textures, new tastes, new food into our diet? So some ways is to vary the taste or the texture. Don't try and do it all at the same time. So something like potatoes, you could start eating mashed potato if you've only ever eaten roast potatoes or chips before. So the taste is very, very similar, but the texture is different. And if you decide that actually, no, that texture is not for me, you go, all right, well, that might rule out other things like rice pudding, for example, because, you know, mashed potato, rice pudding, it's that kind of what I describe as gacky, which is I don't think is a word in the English dictionary, but it should be um, that kind of thick but creamy, bit wet, stodgy kind of texture that, that happens to be something that a lot of people are not, not keen on at all. Different tastes are much easier to add as well. So using things like seasonings, a um, bit of spice, bit of herbs, things like that. If you want to, if you're quite happy eating chicken nuggets and chips every day, go for it, knock yourself out. Um, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning, I'm not a dietitian or a nutritionist, and I'm not telling you how to eat a varied diet. I'm just purely trying to make some suggestions of how, if you wanted to change your diet, little things that you could kind of do so it's not really overwhelming. So, done what we eat. How about how we eat, the systems? So this fits into maybe fixed routines around when you're eating. 
systems take away uncertainty um, of what to eat and when. So having a rigid diet, if better, for want of a better word, um, means that you don't have to think about it. A lot of autistic people are very brand loyal as well because you know what you're getting with a box of Kellogg's cornflakes and the own brand ones just don't taste the same. Um, you know, I think that and when I was doing some research for the book, um, there was a lot of people that had said that their parents just didn't understand the difference. And the difference is massive um, between one shape of pasta and another shape of pasta. The problems can arise when you can't have your system, can't have your fixed routine, and then what do you do about it? Which I'll come on to a little bit later on. The other thing that's important is what you eat your food on. I have a coffee mug that if it's dirty in the morning, I will wash it up. I will not use another mug. It is perfect. It's the perfect shape. It's the perfect size. It's just perfect. And drinking out of any other mug for my cup of coffee in the morning feels wrong. And it's the same with plates. I went and splashed out on some new plates. There's four colours. I'll only eat off two of them because the other two, it's just not computing in my brain that food just does not look right on them. Um, and this may resonate with some of you. It may not. Obviously, this is not a all autistic people do this. It's absolutely not the case but is a lot of autistic people that I've met that do. Um, and some of these questions actually form my, um, uh, the diagnosis process that I use um, because I have seen trends in people. This question here, why the little spoon? I'd never considered this before um, until I started asking a few people, what is it about eating things with a little spoon? It prolongs your enjoyment of it. It's logical. You get lots and lots of little mouthfuls rather than it being over in three or four bites. Try it. If you've not tried it before, try it. You might become a little spoon convert. How you eat your food is really important as well. So is it allowed to touch on the plate? Are the hot aspects of it and the cold aspects, are they allowed together? I really like ice cream and custard together, which is a bit weird, but... I know other people that just go hot and cold together is just wrong. Just the, the, the sensoriness of that is not OK. Or is it a big mix, mix it all up so that every mouthful is pretty much the same thing and that there's no surprises in it? You know what you're getting. And also order of food, of how you eat it. From my not particularly scientific research, um, it's save the best bit till last. But that's just, again, that's just logical. Why would you have your manky bit of cold broccoli as the last thing, the last taste in your mouth? Surely it should be the best bit of, on your plate, unless that is your favourite, and there's no judgment here for that whatsoever. And also having systems around when you eat your food, so fixed times of day, so that you can plan the rest of your life. It just makes that, again, that decision-making process. It's just one less thing that you have to think about. So what I want you to think about, don't answer this question at the moment. We'll come to this at the end. But think about why do you eat what you do and when you do it as well? Just consider that about yourselves um, and, and just see if any of this kind of resonates with you or, or makes sense. <clears throat> so eating out of the house, the impact of eating out of the house can be massive. Whether it's at a restaurant, at work, at school, or at other people's houses. Some ways that we can minimise this of eating out in general, maybe if it's in public, is to pick tables that are not near the door. So you're not getting a draft, you're not having you're not getting distracted by all of the people that are coming and going. Maybe in the corner of the room, away from others as well, so that you're not constantly having to filter out all of the noise, which is therefore taking away your enjoyment from the food. Make the environment as best suited to you as possible. If you've got a favourite set of cutlery, take it to a bloody restaurant. 
Yes, it's not, you know, maybe the the most kind of stereotypical thing to do to go out, but why not? If it makes your enjoyment of food just that little bit better, go for it. Obviously, making the environment sort of best suited to you is easier if you are at other people's houses. Um, you know, rock up with your whole cutlery set, crockery, mug, the lot, the works. Just go, there we go. I'd like my food on this plate, please. No offence about yours. It's just not mine. And, and that's important to me. If you're going out to eat in a restaurant, look at the menu beforehand. Pick what you're going to eat beforehand so that you don't, when you get there, you're not bombarded with all of the sensory stuff and the decision making stuff and the social stuff with that, you know, having to communicate with the person that you're with or go out by yourself. It's beautiful. It is blissful. You can stick your headphones on. You can read your book. You get to enjoy your food in peace and not have to worry about having a conversation with somebody else. Also, limit the number of people that you meet up with if eating out is stressful. So, you know, maybe one on one, maybe that's too intense. Maybe only go, you know, maybe go for two or three people so that you can kind of sit back and just observe when you need to. If you've got routines with what times you eat, stick to them. You know, if your dinner's at seven o'clock, book a table for seven o'clock. You run the risk of it being busy, but you've got to work out which one's more important to you. When you are looking at the menu in advance, potentially pick a couple, have a backup, just in case the thing that you have got your heart set on isn't available, because we've all been there and it's gutting. When you go, oh, I really wanted the steak or the, the vegan lasagna. No, oh, they haven't got it. Now what do I do? Think of something that's, that's safe. I've seen, I've met people that have loads of different strategies with picking. It's their safe thing or it's the thing that they don't, they can't cook, um, which is one of mine. If there's a risotto, I quite like eating risotto because I'm terrible at cooking it. Um, but also um, I met somebody who did, um, she went down the list and the first thing she, that she came to on the starters that she liked, she picked it. And then that was the same for the mains and the same for the pudding. And that was her system so that she didn't have to worry about choosing or trying to decide um, when she's out and about. If you don't have a system, come up with one. You know, these are just suggestions. So just come up with your own. Take entertainment as well, especially if you've got a, an autistic kid with you. Um, you know, iPads headphones coloring in whatever even take that for yourself if you want to if you want to sit there and do some coloring in or the crossword while you're eating your dinner absolutely go for it so eating out at work um pat lunches might be easier because you've got more control over them you may be able to take them to sit in a quieter place while you're eating um, them away from the kind of hustle and bustle of busy canteens if there is one um the problem with canteen food is that most of the time it's pretty grim um, and you don't get a huge amount of choice over over what you're eating. So make sure that you you take that, you know, on board and, and make sure that you have everything. Um, a client of mine uh, eats the same rice and vegetables every single day for her lunch because it's safe for her. When she's out, she's at work, she's a teacher. So she's in a very busy environment, teaching kids all the time. Um, and it has been pointed out to her by her colleagues, oh, you always eat the same thing. And she just goes, yes, I'm autistic. And it, save, it serves me well just to have a safe thing in, in a day of chaos. So food planning, how to bring order into chaos. So one of my ideas is a food audit that you can do for yourself or you could do for your kid. It doesn't matter. Think about what brands you might what you like. What are your safe foods? What foods can go together and what foods can't? Because it might be that on a bacon sarni, tomato ketchup is fine, but if it's got an egg in it, then tomato ketchup's not okay. It needs to be something else. Think about all of the things, the possibilities, and if that is limited it doesn't matter maybe then think about how you can kind of mix them up a bit if you want to 
also think about what foods make up a varied meal. So protein, veg, carbs. They're your four kind of staple of a of a varied meal. If you can get a bit of all of those into your into your food every day, well done. You're doing well. Um, don't worry about the rest of it. Just concentrate on what, what is easy for you. So then from the food audit, you can start meal planning. Um, I do a weekly food plan. So I know exactly what I'm going to have for dinners seven days in advance. I work. I've got kids. If I don't do that, we're eating takeaway which my children would absolutely love, but my bank balance and my waistline wouldn't, and neither would their health. So in order to make sure that I can provide food for my family, I plan it in advance. I then write a shopping list from what I've planned, and I go and do that. It has taken me a long time to be able to get to that point, and it's taken trial and error. Um, you know, I, there has been times where we have lived off ready meals because I'm too exhausted. But if I know what's coming in my day, day to day, which I do, then I can know that I'm going to have enough energy to cook this thing. Or is this a sorry, guys, you're going to have to chuck some pizzas in the oven jobby this evening. So thinking about how many spoons how many tickets how many energy credits you've got left at the end of the day will help you plan going forward will help you plan what to eat and, and what what to cook and, and what's okay okay for you on that on that day keep it really simple we eat the same maybe 10 15 dishes on a bit of a rotation it's not rigid as in mondays we have this thing tuesdays we have this thing but it is kind of you know okay we've got this in the freezer that will do um and and you know that that's how i tend to do it um like i said right at the beginning food is my special interest i need to have control over my food otherwise i snack and i don't eat properly and then therefore that has a knock-on effect to how i am feeling in my day-to-day -day life and actually how I can perform doing my job as well if I don't eat a varied enough diet um, or eat at the right time. Living off chocolate, biscuits and crisps doesn't do many people much good long term. So getting a slow cooker, planning easy meals, the slow cooker has absolutely revolutionised my life. Because I get up in the morning, I chuck everything into a pot, I switch it on, and there is a meal at the end of the day. Bar some cutting up some vegetables, there is nothing else that needs doing. It is so easy. And you can get massive ones and you can get teeny weeny ones, depending on how many people you are catering for. Um, and if you haven't got one, go and, find, go and buy one because they're brilliant. Um, as I've written here, and as I kind of mentioned a few times, it's okay to eat the same thing repeatedly. If I eat breakfast, I have the same thing, and it's a protein shake, because it's quick and it's easy, and that's it. I don't have to think about it. I glug it down in one go, and that's it. I can get on with my day. My lunches are very similar. It's either leftovers or chicken and potato. Chicken and sweet potato or chicken and, and salad, um, and that's about it. It's quick and easy. I don't have to engage with it. And please, please, please remember that it is okay to repeat the same meals throughout the week. If you love spaghetti bolognese five days in a row, go for it. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Like I said, caveat, I am not a nutritionist or a dietitian, and I am sure that there are people out there that would tell you that it is absolutely awful for you and that you shouldn't do it. Um, but pff, sod them. Things like food shopping as well. Autism friendly hours in supermarkets do exist. I will be honest, I have never used them. Um, I've been told that they have lower lighting and no music on. I don't know whether or not they turn off that horrible beep throughout the checkout. If they don't, they should. In fact, they should just in general, in my opinion, because it's, it's awful. It's a terrible, terrible thing. Make sure that you write lists 
as well. Don't just try and go into the supermarket with, you know, just going, oh, I will see what I fancy. If I did that, I'd become incredibly overwhelmed and leave with a load of rubbish and a bottle of wine. Uh, and that's about it. And think about alternative brands just in case they don't have the brand that you want or an alternative shop for you to go to, um, depending on, on on what's more important to you. Um, food prep, make sure you get everything ready first. If you're a visual thinker, put it in order of, you know, like, right, the onion needs to go in now. This needs to go in then. Do, 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 do. And really, really think about it. Be really systematic. Use your autistic, autistic systematic brain to guide you with, with how you cook, if you want to cook. Combating sensory input when cooking for yourself. Wear gloves, like latex gloves, uh, surgical gloves, if you don't like the feel of food on your hands. Goggles when chopping onions. My children do have a picture of me wearing swimming goggles whilst chopping onions. I looked ridiculous, but my God, did it work. It was brilliant. Um, I, my eyes didn't run and I need to do it more often. Face masks as well. I'm sure that, you know, after COVID, all of us have got boxes and boxes and boxes of face masks. If the kind of smells too much or the taste is too much while you're cooking, stick one of them on. Get creative and use anything that you possibly can to think of how you kind of combat it. Um, I use these, my noise cancelling headphones, a lot while I'm cooking, um, especially if there's like the washing machines going at the same time as something's being fried. Um, stick a podcast on or some music on and it just blocks everything else out around me um, and I can just concentrate on, on what I'm doing. So, things linked with autism and eating. Eating disorders. Um, as I said right at the start, this was a bit of an uh, area of special interest of mine when I was doing my postgrad uh, certificate. And the reason for this is that people believe that, or sort of research suggests that up to 37% of anorexic patients are also sick. And that is huge. If you think about the small percentage of people of the population who are autistic, that, that we are taking up 37 percent of those with eating disorders. My argument is, is that it's not necessarily always textbook clinical anorexia, that the motivations from the people that I have spoken to are very different, that this isn't not necessarily to do with body dysmorphia. It's to do with routines um anxiety around uncertainty and needing to plan not liking a lot of food due to a sensory thing or it being all of these things put together motivations can also include in girls uh body changes linked with puberty as well that if you stop eating it stops those changes from happening um Fixed rules around food, such as calorie counting, um, coming up with a number or reading somewhere that to be healthy, you need to only eat a thousand calories a day, um, which isn't healthy for you at all because you will rapidly lose body weight. Also, things like only being able to have a certain number of items on your plate as well. So five peas, uh, one potato and 30 grams of chicken breast um, as well. So it's really rigid. We are talking extreme rigidity around food here. Um, also control. Food is the only thing, or the first thing, sorry, that you can control from a very, very young age, especially now that we are not in the 80s and 90s anymore, and we know that we are not allowed to get our children in a headlock and force feed them, that that's not okay. Um, so this idea around, you know, the whole world is just too chaotic for me. So I'm going to I'm going to just control this one little bit that I can. And obviously, in, it, in its extreme, this leads to eating disorders and, you know, dangerously low body weights. Food and exercise can also become an intense interest um, and being sort of hyper 
uh, sort of fixated on what you're putting in your body. So not necessarily, you know, I like all food, but, you know, I will only eat the good foods, the foods that I have read or been told or deemed to be good foods. And another reason that somebody gave me for their uh, for becoming into, in, um, sorry, anorexic uh, was wanting to fit in that their narrative was if I change how I look, then people will accept me. And this was from an undiagnosed autistic woman. Um, oh, sorry, she obviously at the time she would have been a teenager, but she was undiagnosed autistic um, and didn't realise that the reason that she didn't fit in wasn't because of what she looked like, it was because her brain was just operating in a, in a wonderful but different way from her peers. So, Arfid, um, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. This is categorised by somebody only eating 10 or less different food items. And the reasons for these may be taste, texture. So all of the sensory stuff that I was kind of talking about earlier on with food, not knowing when they're hungry, a low interest in eating because it gets in the way of the fun stuff. This according to research, is more common in children, but I don't know if that is just because it just hasn't been studied in adults. Um, so there may be many autistic adults out there that would fit into the kind of ARFID category, but because their weight, lo uh, sorry, their weight isn't kind of dangerously low, they're just not being kind of picked up, um, or they're just really happy just having their 10 items or less, and, and that's it. And then pika or pika, depending on who you are and how you pronounce it. There is really not very much research being done on this at all. So pika is eating non-food items or unedible food items. So things like Lego, charcoal, um, wood. The stuffing out of the sofa, much to the delight of one of my client's parents when she was a child. Um, and the thought is that it's linked to sensory seeking, that um, you cannot get the same sensory impact from eating a bit of Lego as you can from any other food that I can ever think of. There just isn't one. So needing that kind of, you know, the hardness, the, the sharp edges, all of that kind of thing um, in your mouth, that you can only get that from eating certain um, items that are not are non edible. So my belief is that it's form of stimming, um, but obviously it can have really detrimental effects on you if you're eating things like screws or glass. Um, it's not going to be good for your digestive system at all. So regardless of the kind of eating disorder, there is a massive lack of support in the UK uh, for helping autistic people with eating differences in general. There is only one hospital that has been kind of set up for autistic individuals with anorexia, and that's the Maudsley in London. Um, and they've called it the, the peace pathway. Um, one of the reasons why I decided to focus on eating disorders for my uh, postgrad was because I looked at the NICE guidelines on the NICE website, on the government website, and there is not one, there wasn't one mention of autism. Yet we have got this ridiculously high proportion of people, but there's no mention of the word autism on there and how you could adapt um, or that there's any link. Uh, which just absolutely blew my mind and my sense of justice and fairness. Um, and I would love to be able to change it. And if anybody's got any ideas, please let me know. So gastro problems, IBS, IBD, really common. Um, there's a bit of evidence that suggests that some autistic people that have got IBS or IBD um, have actually got a different kind of makeup in their butt, uh, gut, sorry, gut biome. Um, it's just different. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody else does in all fairness, but it, it, it just is. So there's these links between kind of, you know, really horrible gastric problems, as well as allergies and intolerances as well. I have just wrote three there, gluten, wheat, lactose, nuts, all sorts of different ones. 
there's a lot of sort of hypotheses around this. My idea, and I don't know, it might be absolute rubbish, <clears throat> is that, as we know, autistic people sort of sense the their surroundings differently, that the environment has a massive impact on them. And that comes out in kind of physical ways. Um, you know, I'm a noise cancelling headphone, sunglass wearing person who cannot stand it when my teenage boys spray links um, because it's disgusting. Um, why can't that be translated into a sensory difference with how you process food in your body? Like I said, there's no science there whatsoever. It was just something that I was kind of thinking about the other day and, and wondering if there is a kind of link there to it. Um, but I'd need somebody else to do the tests for me. I failed GCSE science. I don't think you want me doing those kind of things. So, hey. as I said right at the beginning, food can cure or, or, um, autism. No, it can't. It absolutely cannot. Nothing can cure autism and nothing should be able to cure, cure, cure autism because being autistic is pretty bloody cool, in my opinion. What we can do is put strategies in place to help us manage how we eat and therefore hopefully give us more energy and time to be able to take on the rest of the world or spend time with our interests and getting all of that amazing autistic joy that a lot of us feel from the things that we, we love. So... My last thoughts are, eat how you want, where you want, when you want, what you want. Use the same mug, plate, cutlery, whatever it is that you need. And finally, eating more spinach will not turn you into Popeye or a neurotypical. Thank you very much.